Thanks everybody for coming. So the talk, the topic of this talk is improving web usability in the search for a cure. So I'll give a little disclaimer. I can't claim to have saved anybody's lives or anything like that with uh, website work. But the background is uh, a few of my clients. They are in the medical scientific industries. And uh, I think this is a good uh, niche to talk about usability because a lot of these more institutional type uh, websites tend to be very old and outdated, not really designed for maximum usability and you know the with with the right audience in mind uh, so so the example websites i 'm going to talk about in this presentation uh, Novian Health and they do uh, laser therapy for breast cancer uh, stem cultures and it 's actually a stem cell e commerce store uh, they actually send stem cells through the mail to labs and stuff, uh, you know, who knew? And uh, the, stem <laughs> the Stem Cell Podcast, and it's a podcast where they just talk science geek stem cell stuff, uh, which seems to be gaining a lot of traction. And uh, so anyway, I'll dive right into the usability and try to go through this stuff quick. Uh, next, okay, so First thing I want to encourage, and this is more of a trend coming up now, is minimalism. It used to be the case where everybody was talking about above the fold. You try to stuff as much stuff in there because people aren't going to scroll down the page. But in reality, this isn't true. Uh, if you're compelling enough, uh, there's you know people will go down. And if you try to pack too much in above the fold, nobody knows what to look at. They don't know... Uh, they, they don't concentrate on what you want them to concentrate on. So I like to use a lot of white space very generously using uh, padding as well between elements. Trying to go like maybe with one column to focus people's attention. If you have like three columns of text, it's, it's a little more distracting. And a lot of things to try to use sparingly. Not too many navigation items, social sharing buttons, ads, form fields. And pretty much you don't want, if you have too many things, you don't control the visitor's uh, perspective on your site. Uh, next, okay. So another, another thing that I, I see, maybe you know, less of a mistake now, but still people make it. And this is probably hard to see because of the, uh, the resolution with monitor, but these are actually different shades of black or gray and different shades of white and off-white. But uh, basically, you, you don't want to use, you know, you, uh, try to avoid using pure black as a background. A lot of you may remember, you know, the 90s where you had the black background and uh, like neon green text and all that stuff and things would blink and have hit counters and all that <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> so, so anyway. <laughs> uh, Avoid using pure black if you can. Uh, very dark gray actually looks, it looks better. It stands out a little bit and it's, it's kind of subtle uh, when you look at different websites. But, uh, but I think it, it does make a difference. And when I see, you know, 100% black or 000 in hex code, it stands out to me. Maybe I just stare at these things too much. But uh, similarly with, uh, with white, Try to use a very light gray. Like if you're going to use, uh, if you have a very dark background, maybe you can use white uh, as text on top of it. Um, but in a lot of cases, off white, or I like to alternate white and like a light gray in sections. Uh, so, so that's another little tip on, on the contrast. Um, color, uh, these are just a couple of resources and I'll have a link to this presentation, uh, so you don't have to copy down URLs. Uh, uh, basically, there's there's some good resources on understanding color, and you know this applies both for design and usability, because there are certain uh, aspects of color that work better for for certain elements or you know uh, contrast that kind of thing. Okay, and so here is. Probably the, uh, 
how should I put it, the, uh, the nicest of the sites I'm gonna show you, one I'm, I'm semi-proud of showing you. Un unfortunately, I have to, I have to fight with, uh, with my clients on the design on <laughs> some of these things. I don't know, any of you who are web designers probably feel the same thing or, or maybe you know, the client's paying the bills, so you know, well, they can get whatever they want. <laughs> Uh, so I try to draw a bit of a balance to try to make a better design, but there's certain things that they really want. So I just talked about spacing between elements, white space, and there's not nearly as much of this as I'm, I normally like, but you know, I kind of won on some other things. And so it's a, a compromise. I'm still pretty happy with the way this site came out. Um, so, so anyways, uh, this is a white background. Um, it's probably not the best resolution. I think the screenshot got stretched a little bit. <clears throat> but, uh, but anyway, so it's a, a d very dark gray for the font. And then, uh, so there's, there's enough distinction. And there's the blue background with the white text, um, in which case, you know, it stands out enough. Uh, and then the bottom is a dark gray, and then you've got some white and some, some, uh, some light blue. All right, uh, next slide. So a few other points on readability. Um, I mentioned color, and I think, you know, there should be high contrast uh, between text and background. Uh, there's a lot of other interesting things you can do with uh, font size, font weight, which is bold or, or not bold, uh, or also lighter than normal. Letter spacing, uh, which is one that you know, I didn't really mess around with for a long time, but it can actually make a pretty di big difference, especially on headings or if you have all capital letters. Uh, line height, paragraph and heading margins, you know, a lot of this is spacing related and that can actually go a long way. When you have no, uh, no space between lines, which is often the default with some of these, these themes, it gets really hard to read because everything's packed too tightly together. So try to give your text some breathing room uh, and your, users will, your visitors will be able to read everything better. Uh, some more stuff on fonts. Uh, just some suggestions that I have. I, I like to avoid using the defaults, mostly just because I think they're overused and it, they stand out as old designs. Um, I mentioned a few of my favorites, which are Google Web Fonts. And if any of you are familiar with Comic Sans, Lobster, or Papyrus, please don't use them. <laughs> uh, and then there's this, uh, this little comic, which I, I really like, how a uh, web design goes to hell. And uh, maybe a little bit of a digression here, but uh, you know, if you let your client have too much control uh, or you ask the wrong people, you end up with designs that are just not only ugly, but uh, terrible for the user experience. So stick to your guns. <laughs> okay, um, calls to action. Uh, this is another one that I see misused a lot. Uh, often you have a color palette that you like to use with your, with your site, and too often you use the same color in your call to action button. And it matches, and you think it looks good, but the purpose of the call to action button is to get people to click on it. And you need to have it contrast enough with the rest of the site. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to use an opposing color to your color scheme. So if you have like a lot of you know, uh, you know, blues and grays and that kind of thing, a big red button is gonna stand out. And it's up to you how obnoxious you wanna make these buttons. But uh, I like to have uh, you know, something bold and just a very different color than what's used elsewhere. Uh, also, on a similar note, try not to use too many different calls to action. Uh, this is something that I've, I've seen a lot. You know, my clients want a you know, button here, a button there, and lots of information on one page. It is a good idea to spread it out. Uh, ideally, you would have one call to action on each page. That's not always gonna be the right case, but uh, you know, just consider it. And the text you use on the, on the call to action, which I, I suppose also applies to the text you use in general on your site, uh, the standard text for a contact form or email subscribe is usually submit. 
and you know, I like to use the word send or maybe join. Uh, it just stands out a little more and it's, and I don't have any numbers to back this up, but I've seen plenty of these uh, informal studies that say you get X percent improved conversion just by using a different word. Uh, so here's the STEM cultures site. This is the one that they do, uh, they sell STEM cells online. Um, so it's not actually, we don't actually take credit cards on this site. It's all purchase orders and checks and that kind of thing. Uh, because it's, we're dealing with, with labs and they're old school on so many different levels. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is another one, this, this one I'm not, terribly proud of the design, but there are some things that I, you know, I did manage to, to improve. One of them, uh, you know, just th there is that color, uh, the color palette. This is a dark red button, if you can't tell uh, with, with the lighting, or maybe I'm just uh, standing in the, in the wrong spot, but it's generally, uh, you know, white, blue, gray uh, color palette, and the red button is designed to stand out. So we've got, we don't have too much information on here. These are all screenshots on a larger monitor. So it, it, depending on your screen, it'll you know, get cut off and there's not quite as much white space on the left and right. But generally I tried to keep the home page pretty clean, not too much information. And uh, we get people to watch the video or click the button to go to the stem cell podcast. And here's an example of one of the product pages. Um, there's some, uh, this, there's actually like a little help widget, which on my screenshot extension sticks it in the middle, but normally that uh, floats to the bottom. And another one, this I'm not terribly proud of, but I figured I'd show you just an example of their product page. Um, and again, this doesn't really fit all of my normal criteria. So I'll point out a few things that if I was allowed to, I would change <laughs> and what I would recommend. Uh, some of these things, there's links to different PDFs and other information. I would either do uh, bullet points or you know, maybe make small buttons, make those stand out because those do influence the purchasing decision. Uh, the add to cart button, they made me use the same color as the, the color palette, uh, but I would make that normally stand out. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure about a red, but uh, something contrasting to, to the blue. Um, and let's see, uh, there's also some stuff in the sidebar generally with e-commerce, you probably don't wanna overstuff too many things. You wanna concentrate people into buying whatever it is that you're selling. Uh, so I'll go on to headings next, and I'll just do a quick check on how I'm doing on time, okay. Uh, so heading tags, I think are very important, and for, for the user, uh, for readability, it's also crucial for SEO. And this is something that, again, maybe it's diverging a little bit from the usability, but I, I recently saw this on a new client site where they, were, they had a blog and the title of the blog was the H1 on every single page. And this is a very high traffic site and they're just shooting themselves in the foot with SEO because their actual blog title, which has all their great keywords, has been relegated to an H2 and it should be the H1. Uh, so, uh, kind of standard stuff uh, with H1s and, and uh, H1 should always be bigger than the H2. You shouldn't skip heading levels if you can help it. Uh, and they should be noticeably, noticeably different. Uh, if, once you've edited the site for a while, if you see a heading somewhere, you should, you should be able to recognize what heading level that is without looking at the code. Um, okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so try to get through the, the boring. Uh, ironically, this is kind of a wall of text uh, that I'm showing you <laughs> on the slide right here, but you know, uh, you know do, do as I say, don't do as I do, <laughs> as I say. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, so one, another thing that, that I see a lot is centering large blocks of text. So if you've got a big paragraph, you shouldn't center all those lines. It, uh, the human eye is, uh, uses certain reference points. And if you have you know, one line um, in, a, in a section, it makes sense to center it. Maybe two lines, once you start getting into three or, or if they're full sentences, it just becomes difficult to read. And uh, similarly with justified text, uh, I see this also on, on larger, uh, when, when it's trying to span a, a larger width. Uh, generally, I, I try to think of it is as if it's like a newspaper, uh, then you, you know, you've got like five columns of text and it makes sense to justify it. But if you notice, you know, when you've, you maybe, maybe you don't notice it, but if you read a newspaper and there's these very thin columns, there's unusual spacing between, uh, between words on some of the lines and it's, it's kind of jarring. So if you have to line it up, uh, you know, just to, in, in some ways it's easier to read if you have multiple columns, but, uh, if you just have, you know, one column, then don't justify it. Uh, you know, people can read, uh, each line easier if it's normally aligned and there's not strange spacing between the words. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the golden ratio. Um, it's roughly, I think, one point, I think 1.618. I think I had it either it's on a previous slide or in an upcoming slide. Um, so I just use 1.6 because it's close enough. And this can, can work with line spacing. It can work with uh, differences between, uh, with, with other sizes as well. And there's this, uh, this interesting typography calculator that is all based on the golden ratio. And a lot of these things, uh, you don't necessarily have to be trained as a designer or usability expert. I think you can learn the basics and just follow those rules. And that's, that's basically what I've done. And all of a sudden I figured, I, f I felt like I got web design uh, for the longest time. I didn't know what made a good design and I just play around with things until something looks good. And you know, if, if you're dealing with clients and you ever have that, have someone tell you, well, I'll know it when I see it, that's kind of the same thing. But if you, if you have a framework in mind to start with, then it makes it a lot easier. And I like to actually force myself into fewer choices. Um, it works better for, for both design and, and for usability if, if you know these you know, certain principles work better than others. Okay, so here is uh, the stem cell podcast. Uh, this one is still in progress. There's a few, a few things actually, af as I take the screenshot, you know, I noticed some things that I, I need to fix on this site. Um, the header doesn't line up. And again, I'm just gonna criticize, uh, <laughs> criticize this and tell you all the things that are wrong with it. Um, maybe I, sh I should send a recording to my client and get them to, <laughs> to, uh, to do this. I'm shaming them publicly. <laughs> uh, so the header doesn't want, so part of this is because we, we extended the width of this of, of the, uh, the content. So the header doesn't stretch across to line up with the left and right. Um, the search bar is not wide enough. Uh, again, that was like based on the previous width. Um, and I guess those are probably the main things. Uh, so on, on this one, I guess the things that are done right, uh, you know, there's some spacing between elements uh, because there's a dark background. And again, this is, it's supposed to be a dark gray and there's, you know, white, like the main content is a white background, you know, whether you can see that or not. Um, you know, those elements are distinct, they stand out. And with the ads as well, uh, fortunately there's no, no ads with a, with a dark, really dark background or really, or a black background. So they, they pop out. Um, and so, so anyway, so some of the other elements on this page, the heading, that is an H1 and that stands out. Um, so this, there's a podcast player. It's, it's pretty much the default WordPress audio player, but uh, you know, there's different options for people to, to click, to play. Uh, we've got some social, social sharing buttons on the side and uh, using some, uh, some bullets to break up the text. So it's not, 
uh, too difficult to read. There are paragraphs, but there's enough spacing and you know, that it doesn't stretch the entire width of the screen, so it is more readable. Okay, so uh, some more related elements to talk about for, for usability. Uh, contrast and consistency. I think these are, these are pretty important principles to follow, and even as you make something and you edit, uh, you may have to go back and you know, do a double check uh, to make sure you're following these things, or as you make these edits, you haven't strayed off the path. Uh, but I'm borrowing this from another source, which I can't remember the name of, but I should attribute it uh, at some point. Um, use contrast in shape, size, and color for distinct elements. So things that you, you want to stand apart from each other. And use consistency in shape, size, and color for related elements. So often you'll have, say, like three columns, and you might have you know, an icon for each one or um, you know, pictures, and you want things to line up. You want them to be the same size. And it's just, you know, it's better, it's cleaner. Everything looks like it's, it's organized. And uh, you, you can get the, it, it's easier to spot the information. It's where it should be. Nothing kind of jumps out as being out of place. And there's just a reference, uh, goodui.org is, is a pretty good site talking about a lot of these things. Okay, here's, uh, so this is going back to the Novian Health site, and this is their uh, about page, which has multiple sections. Um, I wanted them to put it into multiple pages, but you know they want it this way, and I wanted more spacing, but again, like I said, you know, I can only get so much, uh, got to compromise. So, uh, so the overview, we've got two columns. They're, they're not justified, which I think would, uh, would not be ideal for reading. And again, this is probably not, you know, the screenshot, I probably should have taken two screenshots. It'd be easier to see. Um, management, so we've got these, uh, all the photos are the same size. The names line up. There's uh, links to their LinkedIn profiles, and then there's these little links underneath where it'll expand for the full description. And they have different lengths for their bios, but because we have this expansion capability, uh, all of these are, they look like the same length, or at least the, the hidden part is the same length. And so it lines up nicely, and um, you know, it just has um, you know, more of a structure uh, board of Directors, similar kind of functionality with uh, accordions, and they have different, um, different lengths for, for the descriptions underneath. Okay, uh, so the last part I want to run through, and then I'll go for some questions. Uh, responsive design, I think, is pretty important, and I think most people probably are familiar with the idea, but one thing that, that is important that uh, you need to consider is that it's not just you know mobile and desktop. There's a lot of stuff in between. There's tablets and there's all sorts of different sizes for tablets. So what I like to do is actually just resize the browser window and just kind of check as as I'm resizing it to make sure nothing looks odd because there might be a you know even a small gap of like say like a 200 pixel with that there may or may not be an actual device with that size but something weird could happen. Things might overlap or, or get cut off. And you know, a proper responsive design should work on every screen with, you know, uh, in between, and then also really wide screens. If you have a desktop or TV with like 4,000 pixels wide, you know, it, it shouldn't stretch certain things out too far. And another thing that, that I see is when, when you're actually on mobile, you should never have to scroll horizontally and sometimes you, you have a site and it actually looks like you can read everything, but you still have the capability to move uh, side to side. And you know, as you're scrolling down, you might move, you might flick your thumb over or something, and then you end up with a bunch of white space and it doesn't look right. And of course, it's a lot worse, or it's a lot worse if your site wasn't mobile responsive at all. But there's these little things like that where uh, you should probably fix 
you know, there's probably some bug in your CSS or you just didn't account for it. And then there's the, uh, the navigation menu. This one I used, I just um, put all the items there because there's only four of them. And personally, I hate hamburger menus because it's just another thing for people to click on. I think if you have a lot of items, you know, if you have like 10 items, then you'll need to hide it. When there's, you know, four or maybe less, I, I actually prefer to just have them out there and you can click directly on it or scroll past them. So this is what the, the Novian Health one looks like on mobile. Um, and, you know, it's, it works. You can see all of the, the content. The, uh, the video wraps down to the next line and gets rid of most of the, the extra padding on the sides. So, uh, yeah, I know I, I think I just ran through a lot of that stuff. Um, so I guess if anybody has any questions, I've got a few more minutes, hopefully. Yeah. So then I kind of go down to headline Yeah. Yeah, what I would recommend doing is to adjust, just adjust the size of, of the heading ones with CSS. Um, and you may have to play around with it to see what, like, what level you're comfortable with. Um, uh, you know, one easy way is, you know, before actually changing it on the theme, you just go into inspect element or, um, you know, depending on your browser, it might be something different. But just you know, play with the different sizes, and then you could either, uh, if you're using a theme, you should probably use be using a child theme. Or um, what I often do is I use a plugin to add some C custom CSS on top of the theme without actually editing the files. Um, but you, generally, you shouldn't edit you know the original theme files. But you can put in these changes, and then if it doesn't look right, you can easily undo it. Um, but yeah, anyway, to answer your question, I would definitely recommend changing the, just the font size instead of, you know, using an H3 or H4 just because it's, it's smaller by default. Yes. And are you always representing your font sizes in pixels or are you moving towards M's and... Yeah, I actually... Are more yeah, I, I prefer uh, REMs, REMs. Um, I, I still like, I, I can't really remember the difference between M's and REM's. I think they're, they're a lot closer than pixels, but pixels are kind of absolute measurements, whereas uh, M's and REM's are more relative, or maybe, maybe REM's are relative and M's aren't. I don't know. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> if I did, I would probably have a better handle on it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you definitely, I avoid using pixels if you can um, with font sizes for for margins and padding it, it makes more sense to use pixels but uh, the big advantage at least for me is on responsive design you can change the HTML font size as a percentage and what that allows you to do is universally reduce the font size of all your fonts on the site as long as they're using relative measurements uh, so in practical terms, basically what this allows you to do is say, you know, a normal site up until 800 pixels wide, you're using the normal font size, and then you reduce it to a certain percentage when it hits 800 pixels or lower. And then you can reduce all the fonts by say 20%. And then, you know, on mobile, say 480 pixels or, or less, you can reduce it by another 20%. And this, this helps especially if you're using large H1s because if those were the same size on mobile, you know, they'll take up the whole screen and it'll wrap over if you have a long headline and it, you know, it becomes very difficult. Um, or you have to write custom CSS just for the H1s and it becomes a big mess. But if you can, if you can change all the font sizes universally, um, that it helps, it, you know, goes a long way and reduces the amount of code you have to do. Yep. Somewhat related, but is there like a style guide that you sometimes default to or any sources you know? Um, there's, so 
I actually, in, in the previous version of this, I had some resources on flat design. And that's kind of the design framework that I lean towards. And this is what you see a lot of these, these startup-y websites follow. And it's, you know, the new, the, new, the new black these days that everybody does, flat design. But I like it because it's, it's much easier. It's kind of a, you know, certain things are flat design and, uh, and everything else isn't. Um, so some, some things like, uh, like excessive borders, uh, gradients, drop shadows, these are all, you know, non-existent in flat design. And for me, it makes things a lot easier because uh, I could never figure out these drop shadows and what looks good, like how much of a shadow and all those kinds of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I would, I would do some, uh, I think you could just probably Google some, uh, some resources on flat design and it should give a good, good framework. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so my, my approach has been, uh, so usually when they hire me, it's not to do a complete redesign. Um, there's like some things that they want fixed and I pretty much, I approach them. If, if we can rebuild it, I'll keep it a similar design, but a little bit better and it'll be much easier in, in the future. It'll be not only easier to manage, but, uh, you know, more secure, you know, more responsive. In some cases, the original site just wasn't responsive. And then I can win these little battles later on because if you if you propose a, a major redesign, it takes it can take a long time to get approval. You know, with with these things, it's the bigger the change, the more uh, you know uh, red tape you have to go through. So I try to make these little incremental changes over time, and then eventually, like I get to something that I'm more proud of. Uh, so so anyway, yeah, the, uh, I would. Unless they come to, uh, my my preference is not to pitch a brand new redesign unless you think that they're actually going to go for it. Um, but you know, kind of get them, you know, going down that path uh, incrementally. Okay. Uh, one. Are we out of time? Okay. Oh, one more, quick. How long was I a designer? Uh, let's see, I've been doing with WordPress for seven years, so maybe six. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you.